um, ride through history, I'm coming to you with type classification. That is something that Anutin asked me uh, to talk about because I have a long-standing love-hate relationship with this, uh, so everything about sorting type. Um, it's something that uh, every typographer is always rolling their eyes when someone's coming up with, I'm going to invent a new type classification. And um, I'm busy with this since high school even, not actually wanting to study graphic design. I didn't even know what that is, but I wanted to um, study chemistry. And our normal art school teacher came in with letter set catalogs and explained to us all the, the German terms of, for type classification. I'll show you later. They are incredible. And I thought, oh, that's just like chemistry. It's easy. And you put something like here and here. And then I, got, uh, then I was hooked and then also wanted to go into this field. So I'm, I have to thank this topic a little bit, um, uh, basically, my whole career. But, um, so type classification is something that you do, or classification in a whole, in general, is something that you do if you have a lot of stuff, like a lot of different things from the same medium product, and you want to sort it a little bit so that you don't have to look at everything all the time. Oh, I'm getting this too, I'm sorry. But it's not always been this way, because we just didn't have so many typefaces. And in the beginning, when there was an really much choice, they, um, you can imagine how they looked like, they all looked like, all looked the same, and they didn't even have names, but they just put them uh, in order of the size and named them with the size, uh, the size didn't have numbers back then, but actual names, so they were called something like Canon was a large size, Pika, English Roman, small Pika, okay, this means smaller than Pika, great Great primer. Um, these were the names of the typefaces because they all, the, the, the printer didn't have so many different styles and you wanted to just uh, describe them by the size. Then the Industrial Revolution happened and all kinds of advertising and display topography and all over the space and people wanted to shout louder than the other shop window or product in, in, um, in the uh, open space. And more loud and, 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 and punchy typefaces appeared that didn't really have any roots in, in history, but were just there to catch your eye and attention and, and yell at you. So these wonderful, ornate and crazy typefaces appeared, and since they weren't really historic, they also didn't really know how to call them. Uh, they were all large, uh, larger than any classical size that had a name back then. So they gave them, they made up names. They gave them like Tuscan, Gothic, Doric, Dor Doric ornamented. They hint at some historic stuff, but they weren't really related to Doric uh, things or um, antique, medieval, French, nothing to do with French, of course. It was just whatever that printer thought he wanted to name this. Uh, name the style, and that also differed by printer. So it was all over the place, uh, but people also didn't really care until um, one of the first classification systems, you can't really say, but principles uh, came up with this uh, practical book about printing, and it is actually a classification idea for a display type. So they didn't even think of sorting the text typefaces back then, but he thought that there were so many crazy styles out there, we have to talk about them somehow. Like if I talk to a printer, I want to have like this kind of typeface. He sorted them, that was the point where I wanted to read it to you. Um, this is fun. I'm not sure if we can do something about it. It always happens when the screen has a higher resolution than the beamer or the projector. Expect beamers, what the Germans say. Um, I'm just talking about something else, sorry. So he invented this idea of, of, of classifying the display styles. Um, but in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, uh, about 100 years ago, they started to also have lots of styles that were for smaller sizes for text. And then this guy, Francis Francis Thibault, came up with the first, we would say, proper classification. But he put a lot of emphasis on the serifs. Um, I'm st still trying to figure out the Thai um, garment of different styles. 
and I'm all talking about Latin type, I didn't even put this disclaimer in front, but I hope you notice it by now. Um, so the, 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 the Western type world thinks that serifs are super important, or at least they thought it back then, and divided the whole world of typefaces into different styles of serifs. Um, why you also have, of course, different other characteristics. Uh, that was also um, worked further along um, this idea by Vox. He came up with this, uh, his uh, very influential system in the 50s that uh, we are still basically using today. And it is also based on the form of the serifs, like in the, uh, when, well, the, with the text typefaces are divided into the different styles of serifs and contrast, and then it is very finely divided also into different uh, lineals or the sans serifs, then in, in sizes are the ones that look like um, cut in stone, then uh, like I, I put the sticker above manuaire, which is sort of manual, and then the scripts uh, that are of course like more calligraphic. And uh, this was the first idea, he refined it a little bit. Um, more people got onto this uh, idea of the serifs. Uh, I'm not going into detail here, but we all know that this is not really the most important thing about um, typefaces. Um, so this um, Vox system was, or happened to be, or turned out to be the most influential, and he got lots of people internationally on board to talk about this, and eventually it was also adopted by the RTP, uh, like um, represented by Jerry here, in the 60s, and um, the, uh, I don't know if you know a type I or the RTP people, they couldn't agree on anything back then already. So, of course, they couldn't agree on any terminology, how to name these groups. Um, the Germans definitely wanted to have black letter in there. That was something that Vox was not really caring about. But Hermann Zapp was the guy back then, and yeah, he is very stern. I don't know if you ever met him, but if he demands something, you put it in there. Um, so the idea after years of discussion was just to give these groups numbers and then every country can, up, can come up with their own term for the group. This is something that we all have forgotten, but it is actually something that happened in the 60s that this was the original idea or the international version of it. The German version, as I said, has very long names. Uh, they are also much more descriptive, if you can read them. Um, and, and we found, or Zapf and his generation found, that uh, Black Letter was not only so important to put them in it at all, but also to further divide it into four groups that none of you see the difference probably. And, and then they put also the, the, the others. So this is, this is uh, a little bit embarrassing from, from today's standpoint. Um, the British uh, gave them a little bit shorter or more catchy names that relate more to Vox. But interestingly, uh, also historically related, uh, they found the sans serifs to be so important that they subdivided the sans serif group as the, or, or, or the first country to do this. And the Germans later on also like had some variations of, of the classification that divided uh, the sans serifs into different groups. Um, they are missing the, um, the black letter group, as you see, they weren't really fond of, of whatever the Germans demanded back then already. They said like graphic is already black letter enough, it's, it's manual that, that fits in there. Um, the problem with this, or there are several problems with this classification is that it's too fine on the one side of, uh, or one end of the classification, the top end, if you look at, oops, this way, no, can I go back, oh, falsch here, yeah. Um, if you remember the slide where you saw all the different letters, the first four groups are all serif typefaces, very finely divided into groups. And then you have this, these big boxes of slab serifs and sans serif type. So it's too coarse and too fine at the same time or in different groups. The terminology, maybe apart from the German, is not very descriptive and has to be learned and no one really who starts studying design and hears these terms doesn't know how to like uh, imagine what this typeface looks like. And that is something that I, of course, also because I'm a teacher and, and see these problems all the time, is something that a classification should actually help with, that we know how these typefaces look like when we read them or see them listed, or you saw this horrible 
font menu that Jerry um, showed. If, if you don't really get an idea of how this typeface works or looks like, then it's, it's definitely the wrong UI. Um, the, today's uh, classifications, apart from in the font menu where there's none at all, are basically almost as simple as this very first display um, classification that we saw uh, from, from over 100 years ago. So usually all the font catalogs and, and apps or whatever are dividing all the typefaces into these super coarse groups. It's at least everything is coarse and it's not that the serifs are like uh, preferred here, so it works all right. But you probably also saw that it doesn't really help you in choosing a typeface or something. And that is something that I think the classifications are mostly for or should be for. Um, that's, yeah, that's what I was trying to ask myself, why should we do this anyway? And there are, of course, several motives why you could be interested in this. The, the first is, of course, to also call your printer and describe a typeface over the phone, and he knows what you're talking about. Or we know what we're talking about when I say sans serif, you know what I'm trying to uh, talk about. Then there's, of course, the, 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 the computer UI, your print shop if you have some letterpress or whatever, or in a font catalog that are not available anymore anyway. Um, but I think the third one today is the most important, and the last one is the thing that maybe the people in the 50s had too much in mind, that they wanted to have like this historically correct order of the serif types first, and then the slab serifs, then the sensor, and then the rest. I think this is, this is nice to talk about typefaces and teach students maybe about type history, but it's not what we use every day. The third point is actually the one that you use almost all the time when you design something. So the, the genres um, help summarize certain features in typefaces, and the only like, thing that it does, apart from just looking at the typefaces, is that it gives the thing, the sum summary, a catchy name. That is what Box succeeded when he calls something Garald or something, that it is a new name that summarizes all the features that these typefaces had in them. But sometimes you can also go a little too far, and if you summarize too little, and you have too many different typeface groups, I mean, I don't know how many people are seeing the, the exact differences of the Didos and the Bodonis to have them in separate group, but if you summarize too largely, then it also doesn't really help you. Um, so, to come up with a good, or maybe with a better way to organize all of the typefaces, we have to look at how the typefaces mainly differ, and again, I'm speaking about the Latin typefaces, where everyone always says, like, yes, serifs, and sans serifs, of course, or serifs look differently. And uh, a thing that I see much more here is that you have variation in stroke thickness as well, which we call contrast, or also like the proportions and roundness and the, the principle of the form is something that maybe historical classifications didn't really pay attention a lot on. Um, and then I went further and thought like, okay, maybe I can list all of the differences that are possible in a typeface, but don't worry, this is not the groups that I'm proposing. <coughs> because uh, of course a genre is made up of several of these, but you have differences in the stroke, differences in the terminals, like the serifs, differences how the strokes come together in a round form or something, and then the, the proportion or the space between them and things like this. This was just uh, um, practice-based research, so to say. Um, and it all started to really click for me when I studied in the Netherlands for a while and learned calligraphy or learned writing is how Gerrit Nordsa is calling it, um, uh, and, and learned about this principle or the theory of writing that he proposed in the 80s. I learned this in the 90s and it was, everything made so much sense to me suddenly. If you try it yourself with a broad nib pen and a pointed nib, then you see that they are just almost automatically coming certain forms from these writing tools. And of course, not all the typefaces are based on these writing tools. We're not making calligraphic typefaces all the time. But you still see these principles in sans serif type. So it's not all about the serifs and the stroke contrast, but it's also how the, the shape is 
I don't know, progressing. The contrast is progressing and how the shape looks like. You see, there's the smiling, open Pac-Man E, and then there's this closed, ugh, stern, uh, static E that closes up together again. And this principle is related to the pointed nib. I just put it in a little bit of a weird order here to um, make space for this, this cube. Uh, find Toshi in, in the coffee break or in the, in, in the um, cocktail break, uh, then he can show you. Did you bring your... No. Oh, okay, do not find Toshi. Look, look up photos of his, uh, his cube. Um, so the principle is that uh, there's... Uh, no, or to go back, if, if it was just serifs and stroke contrast that matters here, all of the three, uh, like the first three typefaces would be the same group. All the serifs with contrast would be the same thing, but it clearly is not for us Western typeface designers. We think like these are completely different typefaces. They feel completely different. You use them for different things. Uh, same with the sans serifs there. They're, they're, not, they're so different that you cannot throw them all in one bucket because they, uh, this one is a little bit, feels a little bit more approachable. This is totally German bureaucracy and the other one is also German but so this shape that is uh, developing here in, or I don't know if, uh, do I have a pointer? Is this a pointer? No. Oh. Oh, I can also use this one. Uh, uh, anyway. So if you look closely, maybe, you see that these shapes of, uh, or these letter forms are still related, although they don't have a serif uh, stroke contrast. But you see how maybe the A is still a little bit more open and the E compared to the middle group. And this is what I, because I didn't really have a name for this or a term and still don't have a good one in English, I just called this the principle of the form. And this is related to the tool that once way back when they were writing with calligraphic pens developed just like by moving it over the, the, the surface of the paper. The principle of the Brodner pen is what um, Nordzai calls translation, so the width of the pen is translated over the surface. The pointed nib in the middle is what Nordzai calls expansion, because it's expanding. Uh, if you put pressure on the nib, it, it makes big wide stroke, and if you just put a little bit pressure on it, it's a thin stroke. And then the third uh, one is the, the very German tool called, uh, or the English called this a speedball pen. It has actually a round plate in, uh, on the top of the nib that can only can create um, strokes of, the, of even thickness. So there's no stroke contrast at all. And yeah, you could draw something like Futura with it, for instance. And these typefaces, um, or th these forms also offer in the aperture, that is the opening of the letter, as I said, and the proportions. Here the, the proportions are a little bit more varied, and in the middle they're all very regular. And then you can maybe give these principles names that I'm still struggling with, and I di didn't even find the, the definite terms yet, but I, for now, call this principle the humanist principle, or a dynamic principle, I also called it the middle one is more static and rational, so everything is more regular. And then the geometric one is the constructed form with a simplified A also. And then we have, like, by introducing this principle, this form model, we have a new descriptor or a, a, a new feature to describe typefaces that relates much more to the feel. And it is also much more expandable, uh, un burdened or not limited to just serifs or stroke contrast, you can also put in, of course, the slab serifs, and you can also put in the calligraphic um, scripts that relate to this tool, or the semi-serifs and the semi-sans and all of the stuff. As long as you see them, like maybe in, in principle, it is open counters, closed counters, static forms or more variety forms, you can still roughly think that they are in the same group. And this also makes it much easier to, to um, attach maybe attributes to them if you want to like, think of a typeface that feels more warm or varied or natural. Every one of us can think of some adjectives here um, which are totally uh, subjective. 
and this is just what I, I came up with as some adjectives to this. But this, this group of typefaces feels more inviting maybe and approachable, it's more open, it's not so, uh, I don't know, reserved. This group is more um, strict, maybe orderly, um, regular, maybe also stiff. Um, this group, to me, I mean, all of this also has to do with the use of these kind of typefaces over the years and years. This, of course, uh, has reminds me of all the uses of Futura and all of the, the things that happened in the 1920s and 30s, and it's maybe more informal because it doesn't look as classical. Um, but you can come up with your own adjectives or ways to, to, to approach this. It just helps you to, to get a little bit of a feel for if you say, I want something really authoritative and strict and, and clear, then you probably don't think of something like this. Oh. Sorry. Um, of course, italics, we think of families when we are talking about these typefaces, feel always a little bit more dynamic and informal than the, the Roman partners. Caps always feel much more distant and, and, I don't know, stiff and formal, at least for me. The Germans don't use all caps so much. In the US it's probably, or in Amer uh, Anglo-American settings, it's much more common and it's probably no problem for you at all. But I, I, I always think like, oh, it's shouting at me. It's, it's always a little weird. Um, and that also gives you some clues when you want to combine typefaces. So maybe combine different scripts, like uh, writing systems can also um, help you introduce something that you can look at if you, it's not just the stroke contrast, but you can also see, is it more like, condensed closing forms that would match maybe your tie or other script that you're using here. Um, you can easily um, combine all these typefaces within one form model with each other. They all harmonize sort of. Or you can go for a very large contrast diagonally, but the typefaces that stand directly next to each other are maybe not the I most ideal fit. Like, I don't know if I would combine Garamond and Bodoni, it's maybe a little too close, or Helvetica and Futura is also maybe not so ideal. So either go for something that is within the same principle or like a script with something like uh, Garamond always works as well. Um, of course, this is not just the, the style or the genre that helps you here. You can also make something bold and large and something small and, and light that always almost fits all the time. So go for really large style contrast or the other way around, something light and sans serif also works. Or you can also take other clues like sometimes the typefaces that are all coming from one designer fit if the designer is not very versatile. Um, they will fit because they all look the same. This works for Eric Spiekermann, this works for Gerhard Unger, although he's very versatile. Um, or you could combine typefaces that come from the same style period. This is, these are both typefaces from the 1920s, 30s that could that have the same feel or, of course, use, use history that could combine pretty well. Um, I, I came up with this system in a, a long time ago and I published it in my book that um, Maren is get sent now because she said that she wants to read it um, when she introduced me. Um, but uh, the problem with this, uh, this approach, as you probably saw here, uh, they don't really have any catchy names. So the idea of the genres was not only to, to put them somewhere, but also to communicate uh, more easily, and that is something that I have not solved yet. Um, but maybe we don't need it so much anymore, because, uh, I mean, firstly, no one is ordering type over the phone for, from a typesetter, maybe. Um, and uh, if you think of classification more like getting them out or filtering for you. We do this with uh, digital systems now all the time anyway, and I'll, I'll show you they have different filtering systems that maybe don't need a single name for the genre, but it is more a modular approach that you, that your name is made up of, the genre is made up of something about the form model, something about the terminal treatment, 
the, the stroke contrast, the proportions, and something like this. So a Garalde, the, 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 the first group that Box introduced, could be described as a dynamic contrast C serif, if you want to say serif not only for contrast typefaces, but it gets messy really easily if you want to describe something like Clarendon, and then Clarendon as a genre is also is really appealing to just use one name and not this very German approach. Uh, and then it's also not as easy today as it used to be with fonts being just one style. Because now, for a long time, with open type features, you can also make something like Futura out of something, uh, out of a normal grotesque. With stylistic sets, you can do exactly that to the aperture, what I described, from close to a little bit closed to really open. So you can make something, oops, uh, rational out of a humanist typeface or a geometric out of a grotesque and, and the other way around. With uh, variable fonts, it's now even not, like, I cannot even put them in one slide, uh, how many variations are possible there. So where do you put these typefaces now? If I want to have just one shelf space or bucket for them, luckily what I find easy with digital typefaces is that they don't have to be in one place anymore. It's not like a book that you put either on the left shelf or the right shelf. You can also tag them with both shelves. So that's my approach right now. I'm, I'm doing all the sorting for fonts then, for instance, that I just click all of the boxes that apply to this typeface. Um, so today, classifications are more for us, helping us to choose a typeface, and that is, we're doing this by narrowing down the choices. There's too many typefaces to look at. If we exclude some from the search, then it, we're getting warmer and warmer to what we are actually uh, searching for or looking for. Or you come with a very concrete idea, you want something like Futura, and then look in the genre and find many alternatives that are maybe a little bit doing what you want to do better or are more expensive and because you want to spend more money or you want something that was designed last year or something. So traditionally, we are told, of course, we should think of the problem first and the audience. But I have to say that whenever someone comes up with a task or a, a design idea, I already think, oh, is this is something that I could use here. And um, I have to remind me to, to listen to the brief first, of course. So I'm, I'm tending to, to think of the third item first, but that is probably also just me. And then you have all the historical connotations or cultural connotations that play into this. You might want to make a reference to, to history and things like this. So this is what the, the academic approach to choosing a typeface would be like. And then there are all these factors that I call the party pooper factors that are like, I don't have the money to spend on typefaces at all. Um, it has to be silk screen printed in nine point uh, we are using Flexo or we are, I don't know, all, all these technical requirements that also can really limit your choice of a typeface because you, you have too little space, you need something condensed. And the good thing about font filtering systems is that they can also give you all like information or features of typefaces, exposed features of typefaces that can help you with these kind of things that you can maybe sort everything, like only look at the compressed typefaces that have a medium weight or something like this if you have tricky printing conditions. Or that have different optical sizes that work in really small or work in really large. So these days, luckily, it really changed just over the past year that we got much better font filtering just on the websites of font foundries these days. Uh, this is it's all not really ideal yet, I have to say. This is the screenshot from Typekit. They um, altered the font filtering a little bit uh, just a couple of months ago. The, the good thing is that what they improved is that you can see more letters and not just, I think it was an A or an R, an a, R A before that. So you can also put in your, uh, your company name or when you want to design a logo, just put the real text in it because that is really important that you see it with a, with the text and in the language that you're using. And then you have these different filtering things. This has a contrast problem. I'm not sure if you can even see it. So um, my wish if anyone from Adobe is listening on Facebook Live, 
you could maybe increase the contrast in your uh, filtering menu here. <laughs> also really good is that you can sort by language support because that is something that, I mean, almost every time I need to choose a typeface these days, it has a requirement like it needs Cyrillic, it needs Thai, of course, or something like this. So this is really important these days and proportions and features and things like this. The recommendations for paragraph and what is the other thing? Heading uh, used to mean that the paragraph typefaces were hinted, the others were not. I think, I'm not sure, if, uh, it's probably still uh, uh, differing by hinting quality, but it means that you can use it in small sizes on the web or not. And then the classification is very rudimentary, so this is a little hit or miss, and I'm also not sure how they are sorting these typefaces. I have not looked into this so much. This is the sorting interface from Tight Network. It does it a little bit differently, so it has also different categories. Wacky, for instance, this is like, I think all the display, or no, they also have decorative. I, just, I think this is the crazy stuff from the 90s. Um, and then you can, you have sliders for the different widths that can be useful, but sometimes what I find um, also useful is to filter for a typeface that has three different widths. That is something that I needed as like when I was looking at typefaces and that is really not helping so much. It just finds you different widths. Uh, if you have different um, radio buttons that you can click at the same time, then you can only get the, the typefaces that have multiple widths. But this is pretty useful here, like the recommended use sizes, where you can also switch and use by function like, uh, then you can have something like books, posters, newspapers and things like this. This is the interface of uh, fonts and is uh, what I just men uh, mentioned. Uh, I like advise them on the classification or the filtering system. This is not what you see at the same time. This is a made up screenshot by me that I uh, compose because it is usually hidden. So you all only see one of these pop out things. And that uh, only works with radio buttons so you don't have sliders. It is super overwhelming. That's a problem but um, we thought we want to show all of the, uh, not, well, not all of them, but to, to, that you can see what is there because if you have to type it in, then it's really hard to imagine, well, what can I choose from? And the weight is also, like you see the weight and the widths are radio buttons so that you can say, I need a typeface family that has an extra light and an ultra fat and not just use the slider. Um, so this is it's something uh, like the classification works manually. I, I, I do it manually. They are reading out the weights. So there's things that these systems could read out of the fonts, also the proportions. But that is something that is uh, done manually here. I think Type Network does at least the proportions and the, or maybe I have to ask Cyrus about this. Um, at least uh, to my information, this is something that they read out of the fonts at first. This is the interface from Fontscom. And again, if someone from Monotype uh, Influential is listening to me, I had to Photoshop this menu and uh, increase the contrast so that it is even projectable. It is light, very light gray, so you can really not read anything. And uh, an interesting slider here is the price slider, uh, which none of the other um, boundaries have. Um, so yeah, you can uh, search for a very expensive typeface if you want to be exclusive. Um, or uh, if you just use the subscription or desktop. The classification is here very rudimentary again. It's the basic groups plus monospace because they are so trendy. And then uh, basic radio buttons for the properties and language also. This is something that I cut off, but this is a, this is a good thing that you can search. And that, that is the most basic uh, sorting, or it's not really helping at all, I would say. So you, on my fonts, you only have like these five groups, but what which is, which is interesting is the order they put it in. It is uh, totally not logical, it is just popularity. I think uh, sans serifs are the most popular fonts, followed super closely by script. They even have uh, their own group for handwriting because this is not just like script, no, no, serifs also. So if you look at the most popular fonts, there's always just one serif typeface or something on my fonts. So this is something that is a Big problem at my fonts, I think they also know this, that you don't find anything there. It is really like you click whatever random thing is on, on the homepage, but I think most of the 
people who land at my funds is that they went there or by a Google search or something like this. So this is, uh, they are using a search engine as their uh, filtering mechanism, so to say. They have these tags, but they are very unhelpful these days because the, there's a huge problem of tax spam on the interface uh, in the system that everyone is just putting in every tag possible, wedding, sunshine, holiday, just to be found if someone is looking for a sunshine typeface. Um, so if some of you want to come up with the one good classification uh, system, it should help you, of course, uh, choose a typeface by thinking about what you want to say with this typeface. What is your intended atmosphere? Do you want to be super rude? Do you want to be sunshine? Is it for a bank and you want to be serious? Um, the genre ordering should give you a little bit of a hint how this typeface behaves and what it says to the other people. Um, it should also be a little bit tighter, not super loose, because then you can find alternatives to maybe overuse typefaces. You don't want to use Helvetica all the time. So look in this group and find active protest, for instance. Or you su uh, search for something that is um, suitable for really small sizes and don't want to look through all of the things, uh, different features, different scripts, and all these things. And then, of course, it's also useful uh, to learn about this so can we have more fun at type conferences and communicate about fonts more clearly and easily. That was it for me. Thank you. <laughs>